So I guess we can jump right into the presentation. We're going to start out with um, a little bit of background info on qualitative research design and then move into the mechanics of data collection and analysis. Um, so the title of our presentation is Qualitative Data Through the Lens of NVivo. And we'll start out with uh, introductions and you can find biographies of myself, Leah and Bella on the symposium website. Um, but we'll give a few minute introduction, um, each of us to, to begin with. So myself, um, I'll start out. My name is David Carroll or Alex Carroll, first name, middle name. Um, I'm a fifth year PhD candidate at Tufts Friedman School in Agriculture, Food and Environment. And I, how did I become involved in qualitative research? Um, this is interesting because I, I started out with my master's degree in agronomy, basically. Um, so I was doing really life sciences, um, looking at corn growth and, you know, like water applications, fertilizer applications. And after my master's degree, I went to Haiti and worked with nonprofit organizations for a few years. And during my time in Haiti, I became more acquainted with the social science side of agriculture and rural development, livelihoods, um, nutrition, the linkages between nutrition and agriculture. I was actually working for a nonprofit that produces RUTF, ready to use therapeutic food um, for treating malnourished children. This nonprofit had a contract with UNICEF in Haiti. Um, so we would produce at a facility in Haiti and they would purchase it from us. And we also interacted with clinics. We had nutrition specialists who worked with the organization as well. I was on the agriculture side, but I got to witness all of these different branches of the organization and became more aware of the linkages um, between agriculture, livelihoods, poverty alleviation, um, sustainable development. And I became more interested in exploring different um, different aspects of this problem and not just um, agronomy. And that's why I applied to the Friedman School program so that I could really do interdisciplinary research. Um, once I got to Friedman, obviously I'm not doing research on Haiti anymore. Um, I started working with B. Rogers, who is here in this uh, symposium as well, on a project that we have that Tufts is doing with a USAID funded program in Burkina Faso called RIFSA, Re Resilience Food Security Activity. It's a five year USAID program uh, with nutrition and agriculture um, interventions in North Central Burkina Faso. And we are, we were brought on to their team to analyze the first phase of their program from 2012 to 2018, and to see what behaviors have, have persisted among the beneficiary population. Are they still using agricultural practices they were taught? Are they still using health and wash and nutrition practices they were taught? And then also are the community-based workers that were trained by this project still providing services to the community? So community-based health agents, um, that vol volunteer village vaccinators who vaccinate poultry and cows, um, agriculture association leaders will provide trainings on agriculture production for farmers in the community. So we're, we're looking at how sustainable these USAID programs are um, through the lens of this particular program in Burkina Faso. And I applied for a Fulbright Fellowship where I went to Burkina Faso from 2021 to 2022 with the Fulbright Foundation and conducted research there with the VIM program that I just mentioned, the USAID program. But at the same time, I was able to collect um, original, like primary qualitative data for my dissertation also. And so my dissertation is very closely tied to this USAID program. Um, I'm looking specifically at agricultural practices. So how, how new technologies or information about agricultural practices are shared among a population, um, when there's these development programs present in the community, when there's the Ministry of Agriculture from Burkina Faso providing training, and then what other mechanisms do farmers use to share information among themselves and to decide whether or not to adopt a new practice. So that's kind of what my research is dealing with. Um, and this is where I started doing qualitative analysis, working on the VIM project with B. Rogers and other collaborators. Um, we, this project is a mixed methods project. So we collected quantitative survey data, but we also collected quantitative qualitative data. So focus group discussions and key informant interviews 
And basically the qualitative data helped us to inform our survey tool that we designed for the quantitative phase. Um, and so, yeah, Friedman and Tufts is basically where I was able to be, to, to be introduced to qualitative data analysis and to gain my first experiences in the field. Um, after I graduate, I would like to move into the either non-academia research sector. So working with a think tank or a research foundation that's not necessarily affiliated with the university or working in the policy or program implementation sphere. I can, I'm kind of open to different opportunities just looking right now. Um, but I do think that I'll continue using qualitative data methods um, in whatever career I end up taking after my program is finished this year. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Um, maybe we can go to the next presenter now, Leah. Thank you, Alex. And also, I just want to take a moment to thank the uh, uh, symposium organizers as well for, for setting up this event. Um, so I'll give a little bit of background on how I got into qualitative analysis as well. I came about it in a very roundabout way. I didn't have uh, analysis experience, um, but I applied for a job at a research think and do tank. Um, and I pestered them enough that they gave me an interview and I received an internship. And it, I got in the door because I spoke Arabic and so I could translate. And then I started on this project that I'm gonna show later on in uh, this uh, workshop that um, they needed a translator for focus group discussions. And so I started sitting in on the focus group discussions and direct translating. And then because I had that proximity to the qualitative data, um, I was able to write the section of the reports on the qualitative analysis. Um, so it was a, a bit of a um, soft push <laughs> into uh, the deep end of qualitative analysis. And that background, um, being able to sit in a room, hear people's stories, and then take that um, into into a report that can inform um, better practices. I got hooked. Um, and so that first uh, research um, organization that I worked for was Impact Initiatives. They often work directly with um, USAID and UN organizations to um, help inform, help create research informed uh, programmatic decisions in the humanitarian and development field. So I was first working in Jordan, um, and then I switched uh, to working on the Syrian uh, refugee crisis for a couple of years. And then I later moved to Bangladesh, um, where I started off working um, with uh, UNICEF on water sanitation and hygiene projects. And then right when I was about to leave, I was offered a position um, with the UN uh, World Food Program, and I um, started working on their food security team. So uh, that helped merge um, my, my main interests um, and focus, which I've been looking at the um, combination of water and food and how climate change um, impacts our access to water and food. So while I was in Bangladesh, um, I realized that I, I was really kind of reaching a moment where I couldn't go much further um, in my career without further education. Uh, so I saw the um, Tufts uh, master's program on sustainable water management. And it was a one-year program that I, I did my focus on water and food. And while at that program, I started being involved in other qualitative um, research projects as well. Uh, most recently on the USAID Ideal Past Forward project, which uh, B. Rogers, who's on this call, is um, the PI for. And that, that's a very different approach to qualitative research that I've done before, but I think it's gonna be an interesting component to bring to this uh, um, workshop. And then currently I am at the Environmental Defense Fund and I'm on um, two teams. I'm on their climate smart or climate resilient food systems team. And I'm also on their climate uh, resilient water systems team. So I've now been able to combine those two interests um, with the lens on climate change and been able to take my qualitative research uh, understanding with me for that. 
And with that, I will hand it over to Bella. Thank you so much, Leah. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Isabella Young, and I am a first year master's student at Tufts University in the Food and Nutrition Policy and Programs Division. I am a recent graduate of Texas A&M um, from the didactic program in dietetics. So my focus has been nutrition oriented. Um, I first became involved with qualitative data analysis through helping Alex um, process some of his dissertation data. So I've spent the last six months working with him, um, going through transcripts and group interviews to learn this process. And so I'm excited to share with you all um, what we have learned. I, in the past, have worked at the International Rescue Committee helping Afghan refugees resettle in Dallas, Texas, and um, am focused on zero hunger programming and fetal and maternal health at Tufts University. So thank you all for joining us. I'll briefly go over some of the contents um, for this workshop. We'll start off with um, laying a little bit of the foundation around uh, qualitative research um, to set the scene. And then once we go through um, the scene setting, we'll have a breakout room um, where participants on this call are able to um, look at a few prompt questions that we will provide uh, and further discuss. And then we'll come back and uh, hopefully have a few volunteers that will be willing to share um, some key highlights from their discussions. And then we will move to um, the second part, which will be a live demonstration of uh, in vivo. Um, I'll go over the basics and then I'm gonna hand it over to Alex to go over the fun part of in vivo. Um, and then we'll break again uh, to see if anyone has any questions um, that we can deal with in smaller groups. And then we will end uh, by showing a few examples from work that um, myself and Alex has done in the past um, and have some time for Q and A's. So with that, I will hand it over to Alex to get us started with research design and implementation. All right, thank you, Leah. So we wanna go through this a little bit quickly. Um, obviously, this could be the subject of a course that lasts several weeks. There's a lot of information here. I'm not going to go over everything in detail because we don't want to bore people with just talking at you for a long period of time. So I'm going to do a very quick overview. We didn't want to jump into in vivo without um, explaining the context for why you would use in vivo. Um, so basically, the first question is why would anyone want to do qualitative research and what is it? Um, Qualitative data is, a lot of people would say it's words instead of numbers, but it can also be more than just words. You could have an image that you're analyzing, you could have a video um, that you're also analyzing. So words, yes, but we can maybe expand that definition to say not numbers. Um, qualitative data is different from quantitative data in that you can delve a lot deeper on a subject with qualitative data. You might not have as broad of an image, you're not looking at a survey of 1,000 or 2,000 people um, where you can collect data from the same data from every single person and you know construct mathematical models and things like that. But with qualitative data, you'll have a smaller number of subjects and you're going to be gathering rich, detailed data from these individuals, from these respondents that will allow you to understand their lived experiences, their opinions, um, nuances that you would not pick up with a quantitative survey. And you can discover feelings, thoughts, and opinions of respondents. You can use qualitative data to inform new concepts and theories or to contribute new information to an existing theory. You can also use it together with quantitative data, either to triangulate on a research question using different data collection modalities, or you can use quantitative, qualitative data to inform a subsequent round of quantitative data collection. Um, that's, what we'd like to, that's what we call mixed methods research. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Sorry, the text is a little small. So this slide is about your theoretical or your conceptual framework. These are very similar concepts, but some researchers would say a theoretical framework is more used for quantitative analysis and a conceptual framework is more for qualitative analysis. Um, it really depends on if you're doing deductive or inductive research. So deductive research, is when you start with a defined framework 
um, for example, diffusion of innovation theory. You build a code book, so you have these different codes that you're defining based on that theory. Um, farmer attributes, community conditions, um, you know, attributes of the innovation itself. So you're kind of defining the codes before you start analyzing. And inductive research, on the other hand, is when you start with a clean slate. You have no preconceived notions, no theories that you're bringing to the table. You're just working with the data. And as you begin working with the data, the themes emerge on their own. And one common method of inductive research is grounded theory. Think of it as starting from the ground up, building a theory from the ground up. Um, and so you need to pick deductive or inductive, or maybe a hybrid method where you use both, um, depending on your research aim and what you're trying to accomplish. Are you trying to do exploratory research? where you explore a new topic that you don't know much about? Are you trying to describe a, a system or a phenomenon or a situation? Or are you trying to explain something with a hypothesis and a, um, that you're trying to test with your data? So, okay, next slide. So there's a lot of different qualitative methods you can use. We don't have time to go into detail about these, but um, basically content analysis is analyzing the content of interviews, focus group discussions, documents, images, um, and pulling out key themes from that content. Narrative analysis is really trying to build a story from that the respondents are telling you. So you you're trying to create a narrative or construct a narrative from the data that you're collecting. Um, discourse analysis is deals with, um, you could say power relationships and just the context in which themes are said. For example, interactions between employees and a CEO at different companies are going to look differently based on the corporate culture and the social norms in that company. So discourse analysis would be analyzing how those interactions differ based on culture. Um, thematic analysis is when you have specific themes that you are looking for and you're going through the data and you're picking out parts of the data that apply to these various themes. Um, so it's kind of deductive in nature. Grounded theory is inductive, like I had mentioned, where you start from the ground up, you start with data, you're doing exploratory analysis, and you're building the theory as you go. Interpretive phenomenological analysis, IPA. This is where you're studying a phenomenon, a specific phenomenon, and um, people's experiences with that phenom phenomenon. Biography is pretty self-evident. A case study is where you're using one single case and going very deep on that one case to really get information about the, the, the thing that you're looking for with one single case. I mean, it could combine various methods. Um, you could have focus group discussions, key informant interviews, direct observation that all are part of a case study. Historical analysis is archival work where you're looking through historical documents and doing your qualitative analysis on these secondary documents. And then we have ethnography, which is really, um, observational in nature and let's see next slide please so wanted to also talk really briefly about bias because qualitative research is great but you need to be careful about bias um, there's two different types of, two different categories of bias here participant bias and researcher bias and we can do things to control both of them so participant bias, acquiescence bias, sometimes respondents will just agree with the um, facilitator just because they want the interview to end maybe. So they're just kind of agreeing, giving the most easy answer. Um, social acceptability bias, respondents will give the answer that makes them look best in front of their peers or in front of you as the researcher um, and give the answer that is the most socially acceptable. Habituation bias, if you're asking similarly structured questions in short succession, the respondents might get used to the structure of the questions and their answers might be distorted by that. So sponsor bias is when they know who sponsored the study and they have an opinion about the sponsor, either a good or a positive or negative opinion, and that affects the way they answer the questions. On the researcher side, confirmation bias is when the researcher is looking for things either explicitly or implicitly that agree with his or her or their predefined hypothesis. 
and maybe discounting or even discarding information that goes against their hypothesis. Um, question order bias. Sometimes the order in which you ask questions in an interview can get, can elicit different responses from the respondents. And so it makes, I'll talk about how to deal with this after. Leading questions are questions that are phrased in a way to encourage a specific response. Um, cultural bias, cultural be, not being cognizant of cultural differences or not being aware of cultural context can lead to cultural bias on the researcher's part. And then the halo horn effect is when a positive or a negative aspect or characteristic of a respondent causes the researcher to either view everything that that person says with a negative or a positive light. Um, avoiding bias, you need to be careful about the way you frame your questions, make them appropriate, open-ended, and engaging, and make sure the order of the questions makes sense. Start with general questions and move into probing questions or more specific questions as you go along. Um, using multiple coders, that's what Bella was mentioning. So she's helping me work on my dissertation data because if I collected my data and coded my data with nobody else's input, um, I would risk running into a lot of these researcher biases. Um, conduct an external review of your work. Obviously, peer review is always very important, whether it's qualitative or otherwise. Um, acknowledging your role in the study, like acknowledging it to yourself and recognizing what your role is and remain and try and really trying to make an effort to remain objective throughout collection and analysis. And then triangulating data sources. So in the literature, looking at what other people have found and what other methods people have used and what they're saying. Um, and then asking participants to evaluate your findings. So maybe dissemination events where you share what you found and ask for feedback from the community where you're working. That can really be a good checkpoint to see if you are off the mark or if you maybe your own biases are getting into, are affecting your results. And I think from there I'll pass it on to, so these are some questions to be thinking about. Um, we're going to give you an opportunity to discuss these in the breakout rooms later on. But um, question one is just a way, it could, I could have asked this about any theoretical approach, but I just asked a question about grounded theory. Think of an example of where you might want to use grounded theory and what research design would you use to approach the study? Um, and then the second question is just to go over the bias and how to avoid bias. Um, I think with that, I'll pass it on to Leah. Thank you. And Bella will um, put these questions in the chat so you can think about them before we go into the break room as well. So um, thank you, Alex. Uh, as he just described, uh, qualitative analysis can have so many components. So sometimes it might seem a little overwhelming. Um, but Tufts has quite a few resources available to make it more accessible. One of them is Tufts has its own institutional review board or IRB. Um, there's two different offices at Tufts. One is the health science IRB and the second is the CBER or the social behavior and educational research IRB. That's a mouthful. Um, and what's maybe just a brief overview on, on what IRB can do in a study. Um, if you have concerns about leading questions like Alex had described or bias or et cetera, it's another platform that is available to look through your research and make sure that it is um, abiding by um, the standards set by the IRB. So a few things about when to engage with IRB, what is needed for submission, and then some training information. Um, these slides will be circulated um, afterwards for anyone who's interested. Um, and we've linked, and I, I believe Bella will also share some of the links to the um, Tufts IRB resources in the chat, um, if she hasn't already. <laughs> and um, I one note is, I believe all master's students at Tufts Friedman School are required to take a city certification. This allows, this is really important because it goes over the basics of how to avoid um, bad research practices. And it's also something that you're required to have some sort of research certification before you can even be officially on a research project. Um, so that's, that's one component is you need to have that certification. But then in terms of engaging IRB, if you are thinking about doing a qualitative assessment, um, 
IRB has standing office hours every um, week and you can chat with them and see, maybe talk through some of the questions to see what you might need. They have a whole checklist, but in general, they engage in studies that involve human research subjects. Uh, the goal is to make sure that we are practicing um, good research ethics when working with other human individuals. Now, you might be doing an assessment that doesn't involve people. It, it might be an assessment on um, soil samples and you wouldn't necessarily have to go um, through the same uh, IRB process for looking at soil samples because you're not engaging human subjects. Um, but if you are doing an assessment that's asking someone's opinion about um, how a situation occurred or how they feel due to lack of access to water, for example, um, then you should be talking with IRB and um, using their resources. So that's a little bit of a delineation um, between when IRB is needed and when it's not. Um, and then for submission, I have here the link to their checklist um, that you can check out. And then um, there's also information about the training materials. So now that we have um, went through the different um, aspects or basics of uh, qualitative research and some of the resources, let's say you have all this data or you have this beautiful qualitative tool that you've made, you've worked on it with IRB, it's approved and you can go out and start collecting data. Um, how do you do that? <laughs> so you can think of qualitative analysis a little bit like a conversation, uh, except it's a scripted conversation. And sometimes even when you're just preparing for a conversation, um, your delivery is wrong and it impacts the whole tone. So that's why pilots are really important is you can test out this script and see if it's actually being delivered in the way um, that you're intending. Another really key point about pilots is, say you're having a conversation, um, if you're gonna ask someone to talk to you for two hours, that's a huge commitment and they might kind of tune you out after hour one. Um, we're hoping that's not the case for this workshop though. But uh, what one thing um, for pilots is you can test how long your um, qualitative assessment tool might take. And then you can workshop if um, you might need to make it shorter because you really wanna set up a tone where it's comfortable to engage in this conversation because that's when you're gonna get the best data possible. So that's, that's a bit on piloting. I think there could be a whole seminar just on um, this component, but I'll leave that to the experts. Um, and then for data collection, so now that you've been approved for actual data collection, you need to come up with a plan for um, how you're gonna collect it. Are you gonna record it? Are you gonna have a tape recorder? Are you gonna ask them permission, et cetera? So that's also something that IRB can help with. Um, and then for data storage, you need to have somewhere that you can store this data, um, hard drive, et cetera. And you also need to ask permission to store it. Um, that's another thing that IRB can support with, but if you're gonna do all the work to have a two hour conversation, you will not retain that, especially if you're having 71 two hour conversations. Um, and so having a system in place for data storage is also a critical component. So I'll go briefly on um, over data types and also on a few different types of qualitative data. So um, as Alex had mentioned uh, there, you can do analysis on videos, you can do observational analysis, et cetera. There's also key informant interviews and there's focus group discussions open-ended surveys, et cetera. All of this would go into some sort of qualitative overview. Um, and maybe I'll just dissect uh, the difference between key informant and focus group discussion. You can sense a little bit um, when it might be appropriate to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation and when it might be appropriate to have a group conversation. Even within um, this workshop, we're gonna have everyone go into breakout rooms. Um, part of that is because if you just put 19 people into a room and then you ask them questions, 
you're probably going to have the people that raise their hand and really like to talk and want to answer. And then you're going to have people that don't feel comfortable answering in front of 19 people. So this kind of helps you to understand what group setting might be more appropriate for the question tool that you are um, submitting or, or trying to work with. Um, so that's that's one key component. Um, key informants would be more one on one and focus group discussions would be smaller groups. Another thing that I'll note on that is these are conversations. And so you're not just collecting the conversation, you're collecting the body language, you're collecting the um, mood in the room. It's so many different things. Um, I can reference, for example, an assessment that I did in Bangladesh, which was on menstrual hygiene. Just setting up that project, I had to consider how do we get it so the women are as comfortable as possible. And if they aren't comfortable, that also gives me a little bit more data. Does that mean that there's cultural nuances around menstrual hygiene? Does it mean that they're not comfortable talking to their daughters, to their mothers? What is the culture around this topic? And that's something that you can take as a direct observation and include in your findings as well, and maybe even add additional um, questions or um, consider how can you ask this question in a way that makes people feel more comfortable? Or is there discomfort something that you might need to plan for um, within your analysis or within your um, suggestions for next steps? So here are a few questions based on that brief overview. Um, I won't spend much time more than, than I have, but they'll get placed in the chat box um, afterwards. And then there'll be great discussions for um, later breakout rooms. And with that, over to Bella. Thank you, Leah. So first we're gonna discuss what data cleaning is. It's also referred to as data cleansing or data wrangling. Um, and it is an early step in the data analytics process. Um, this crucial exercise involves preparing and validating data, which takes place before the core analysis is completed. So data cleaning is not just a case of removing erroneous data, but it's often part of it. Um, the majority of the work goes into detecting rogue data um, wherever it is um, able to be found and then correcting it. So rogue data can include incomplete, inaccurate, irrelevant, corrupt, or incorrectly formatted data. And so this process also involves um, deduplicating and removing anything that's been incorrectly inputted more than once. And so effectively you're merging or removing identical, identical data points. So often people will say garbage in, garbage out. And so what this implies is that the quality of your data, if it is subpar, then the results of your analysis will also be flawed. So even if you follow every other step perfectly of the data analysis process, um, if your data is a mess, it won't make a difference. So for this reason, the importance of adequately cleaning data can't be overstated. Um, it's like creating the foundation of a building. And if you do it right, it's something that will be solid and long lasting, but if you do it wrong, it is easy for the data to fall apart. And so. The key benefits include staying organized, avoiding mistakes, you can improve your productivity, um, reduce unnecessary cost of having to go back and redo interviews that it can be very costly in translation. Um, and you can also improve your mapping abilities that we'll go into later with Invivo and how you can strategically place all of this um, in a presentation. And so first you're gonna go in and remove all the irrelevant observations and then fix structural errors and ensure that it's all formatted properly um, you're going to remove any unwanted outliers that skew your data. And then once you've handled all the missing data, then you can validate it and then move on from the data cleaning process. And then next we're going to talk about transcription and translation. So transcription is when you're making a written crop written copy of something that you're transcribing. Um, it, it can involve documents, but also audio information. So it can be writing down a, a copy of a document and creating a second copy would be an example of transcription, but often we're referring to it as listening to an audio file and creating a written record of what has been spoken. When a document or audio file is transcribed, the written output is supposed to be an exact copy of what has been shared in an interview um, or audio file. And instead, it's an accurate, so it's an accurate depiction of the original material. So 
And then translation, on the other hand, is a rendering from one language to another. So it involves taking the material that has been has gone through the transcription process and converting it into a different language. Um, without trans with translation, accuracy is also very crucial. Um, ensuring the original material covers what has been spoken, but also understanding that there is an underlying contextual meaning to a lot of different interviews. So something that's spoken in Bangladesh is going to be very different than South Africa, very different than Guatemala. And so taking into account those contextual clues and cultural significance. And so they are both similar and they aim to ensure a high degree of accuracy and maintain the information within the context to their best ability and involve often written documents that can be analyzed as we'll see in in vivo later. Um, but the primary difference is that translation involves converting material while transcription often only involves one specific language source. And so when Alex and I originally received the trans the translation of the data that he had collected in Burkina Faso, we noticed that it was stark, it was much shorter and condensed than the original translate transcription. And so we had to go back and have another translator look at the information to ensure that everything had been taken into account because any small detail that was missing could be important important for our analysis like later on down the line. So, and here are a few prompts that I will put in the chat. And so we are about to head into breakout rooms and begin discussing these different topics. Thank you. So we'll set up uh, three different breakout rooms and then myself, Alex and Bella will pop into those rooms. Um, but the first uh, breakout room will discuss uh, prompt one, and they'll be, I think, named accordingly if we can manage that. And then the second will do um, prompt two, and then the third will do prompt three. Um, we'll be in the breakout rooms for about 10 minutes. And uh, as we mentioned, we'll flow in in case you want to bounce any questions off of us. Um, and then uh, we really welcome uh, discussion afterwards. Um, for key highlights that uh, were gone over during those breakout rooms. Okay, so is everyone back now? Perfect. Um, so it'd be great to hear uh, any key highlights um, from those breakout room discussions. Um, I'll give it about 30 seconds to see if anyone wants to raise their hand or um, share some thoughts. Otherwise, um, you all might be tired of our voices, but we can give some uh, highlights from the conversations uh, for the breakout rooms that we were in. Perfect, go ahead. I see a hand up from Gideon. All right, so um, um, we actually just have looked at the prompt two. Um, time didn't permit us to go around the other prompts. Um, you know, in, in the case of um, conducting an assessment and then um, uh, noticing that uh, the participants feel uncomfortable, during the interview, so we were trying to you know look at it from from a different uh, local and uh, national perspectives. So um, one of the the insights or highlights we we considered was uh, you know for 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 participants to most times uh, to feel comfortable um, engaging in an interview, particularly if they are if 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 these participants are. Uh, particularly, particularly when you look at uh, maybe the, 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 the background, the, the social status of the participant, it might be good to, to incorporate uh, um, people they are familiar with, faces they are familiar with, more, more like if it's a community survey, community heads, and um, people who are quite dependable and reliable within their, their, their setting. So when those people talk to them, when those people are, are somewhat available in such a engagement, it makes them feel reassured uh, than, than when you are you as the investigator is um, is not familiar to, to them and um, it makes them 
maybe want to panic and all. So I think that is also an approach that helps. Then too, we we are we 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 are also trying to look at um, incentives. At what point? At what point is it is it um, hypothetical and advisable to to communicate? Uh, uh, um, to, to communicate that the incentive would be part of the, you know, that's part of the uh, the benefits associated with uh, with participation in the research. Should should it be before, or will it be um, after they have uh, participated and then the incentives are given? So so those were the core um, uh, highlights or high points of our conversation. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Are there any thoughts um, based on Gideon's, uh, what Gideon shared? Also a chance for anyone else to share, share their thoughts. Um, I don't know, Bree, were you in a breakout room? Can I call on you? Um, yes, and um, we talked about um, some of the challenges, how it can get tricky with um, transcribing um, and translating interviews when you're, especially when you're dealing with multiple languages or a language that um, maybe is not spoken very widely, but um, how important it is to uh, make sure that it's being, you know, captured like verbatim, um, but how it's, you know, it can be quite challenging to do that sometimes. Um, yeah. Thank you. All right. Um, we, we won't have time to go too in depth on these prompts, but we really enjoy everyone's engagement um, in the breakout rooms. Uh, we want to make sure now that we have some time to go into um, the interactive component where we actually show some aspects about in vivo. Um, so I will be sharing my screen and I will be giving a active demonstration of um, the basics of in vivo. And then Bella will also share a um, Think about a four page document that provides a lot of resources for people to get started with in vivo um, if they're interested. And just as a preface, in vivo is a tool that exists um, to analyze qualitative analysis. Um, and I think I'll pause here and see if Alex or Bella have any last thoughts on this first section um, before we move into the interactive piece. I don't think so. Um, just Gideon's comment just made me think of my own dissertation data collection. Um, having local enumerators who spoke Moray language and who knew Kaya commune, the area where I did my research very well, did definitely um, encourage the respondents to to be at ease to share their their views and perspectives. Um, they, I mean, if even if even if I spoke Moray fluently, I think it would be different. Um, if I did not have local enumerators who were working with me. And then also we divided into female and male groups because um, we wanted women to feel comfortable sharing their views and their opinions, especially when they relate to gender um, and agricultural production without having any men present. And so we had a woman um, and who was like the facilitator of that discussion as well, just to make sure that they felt completely comfortable sharing their perspectives 100%. That's the only thing. Anything from you? No, I think that Bree did a wonderful job of um, just, we talked a lot about the importance of having local and native speakers um, be able to account for cultural contexts. And so that was a huge part of our discussion, so. Yeah, yeah. I think I'll just make one last mark on uh, what Gideon shared and just feeding off of what Alex had shared. Um, we know that incentives can seem, um, 
maybe like we're not supposed to, but I think if you're in the Boston area um, and you've been on public transportation, there's always advertisements for participate in this sleep study and receive a thousand dollars or something. Um, so that's a really clear example of someone saying you will get an incentive if you participate in this study. And we were just talking about the local context um, as well. Uh, similarly, I, I worked on an assessment in Bangladesh um, where it was on menstrual hygiene. So we were trying to have women participate looking at having similar age groups because you've countered different things at different ages. Um, but when you're talking to um, individuals that are of menstruation age, they normally have children as well. So an incentive could be childcare for the two hours that you might want to talk to the person. And then just valuing people's time. If you're asking them to provide information, they deserve to be compensated. Um, there, you're getting a lot out of that conversation. Um, and if you don't give a similar respect for their two hours or whatever amount of time that they're giving, um, it's not necessarily a fair um, relationship dynamic and that can set a precedence for the conversation as well. Okay, with that, I will close our presentation and move into our interactive component. So Bella just shared a in vivo training document. Um, you're welcome to use this. We won't go fully in depth um, on everything in this guide because we don't have time. Um, but hopefully this will be a helpful resource uh, to use later on in case you're starting out with in vivo. So I will preface a few things. There are many different qualitative analysis tools that exist. Um, in the title of our presentation, there was also a platform called Research AI, which may be um, before we close. I know we have um, someone on the call that is quite experienced with that, Susie. Um, so if you had a few words about Research AI, that would also be great, um, maybe towards the end of the session. But in vivo is a really expensive package. Um, it can cost about $1,000 for um, a license um, for a year. So it's not necessarily always accessible for people, but there's also other platforms such as research uh, AI or um, other tools that are online and open source and free or more affordable. So that's something to really consider, but a lot of them do operate on, um, they operate uh, similarly in that they are tools to compile all of your qualitative analysis and um, come up with key findings. So that's the main premise of the qualitative assessment tool. Another note um, before diving deeper in is that Tufts has license for in vivo that are available for faculty and students for free while you are a student. And so this might be a really good opportunity if we have any students on the call and you're interested in exploring in vivo while you're still um, a student, you can call, I, I think Bella might have shared this link as well, um, you can call um, the number associated with the link and have this package downloaded while you're a student and explore what it's like, because it's also a great resume builder to have some experience with in vivo. So without further ado, um, we'll get into the meat of how to use in vivo. Um, this is the how the interface looks. Uh, can everyone still see my screen? It, does it look like in vivo? Perfect. So this is how the interface for in vivo looks when you open it. This is the latest version that exists. Um, Leah, I yes. see the test, um, I see the training guide on the left and then um, on the right, it's like account getting started. Is that what you're look, trying to show? Um, I'm not sure, but I'll reshare just to make sure. Okay. Is this what was up? Yes. Okay, then yes, that's what I was hoping to share. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Perfect. <laughs> no, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so this is the interface that InVivo looks like when you open it. Um, you can see, I'll just make it full screen real quick. Um, 
And we're just gonna hope that my computer tolerates having so many programs running at the same time. Um, but there's a sample project here and there's more sample projects. There's getting started, there's help resources, there's learning and content. So there's a lot of information already here um, that you can explore with. And I'll also note that um, in Vivo, there's many tutorials that exist online that are very in-depth, far more in-depth than what we can get to in this workshop. Um, and a lot of them explore in Vivo using the sample projects um, that exist right here. So this is something you can further explore with those other um, guides that I have linked in that package that Bella shared in the chat. I'm gonna start with a sample project to show you what this looks like. And here we go. So this is where I end up and I'm gonna leave it at this point. And I'm also going to look at the in vivo training guide to give an overview of what this guide includes. As mentioned, we won't be able to get into all of it in super in depth. Um, but we'll start with an overview of the basics. How do you open up your account? How do you set it up? How do you import data? Um, how do you make sure that your signature exists? And then we'll look at the basics of codes and slightly review cases. And then um, I'm gonna leave some of the query and reports and some of the magic that Invivo can do for Alex to cover. But just to know that you have this resource if you need further tools. Um, and then another note on this overview, and I'll keep it open during the presentation so you can see how it aligns. Um, there's linked resources. So there's an in vivo basic training for this 2022 package. It's an hour and 10 minutes, and it goes over um, the ins and outs of in vivo pretty thoroughly. And then there's also overviews broken down by what your question might be. So say you have a question about coding, you can go to this link where there's 30 different or 36 different videos and you can say, I don't know how to code a video um, as opposed to um, an audio script. And so then you can go here and find that associated link and really delve deeper. I probably listened or watched these videos while I was learning in vivo um, quite a few times. So I've, I found them personally helpful. So I linked them in case they might be helpful for those in the call. Um, but for getting started, the basics for in vivo, a lot of times researchers will be doing analysis with more than one person. It does definitely strengthen the assessment if you have multiple people. So how you can actually set that up in in vivo is in vivo allows every single user of it to have a sort of fingerprint. And that fingerprint becomes apparent when you're doing the analysis um, by being your signature. So I'll show you how to set up your fingerprint in vivo so that you know who is coding what, and um, you can use that to compare maybe on the project Alex and Bella are working on. Maybe um, Bella codes one way and Alex codes a different way by separating the data by signature, you can see how closely or not closely their review of the qualitative data aligns. So that's why I'll show you the fingerprint. Seems basic, but it's really helpful. And it's great to do this as a first step because if you miss this first step, then it's really hard to correct later on. But you'll go to file and then you'll go to options. And then you're at this general display. And you'll see here user profile. So I have my name and then I have my initials. And you can also click this right here. So it says prompt user on launch. And then anything I do within this in vivo file will contain my initials. That's the first step you should do when you open up in vivo. The next step is you can really get into the weeds with um, in vivo in general. And if you don't save it, you lose it. And everyone's lost data at some point and been really sad. So to avoid losing all of your hard work, um, you can go to file and then project properties. And then there's a save and recovery option. 
and I always set it up so it prompts me to save my work every 15 minutes. And then you can also click, do you want to auto save the project or not? And you can decide if that's going to be helpful or not. So, and then you also have this project recovery. So every 30 minutes, it stores the most recent one file. Um, my computer crashed once and this really saved me because the auto recovery was uh, working. So those are some of the very basics, but very, very helpful. And there's screenshots um, here available in case you want to um, do this later. And then there's also those uh, resources. Now, I'll spend about 10 minutes or maybe like eight more minutes going over um, some of these ins and outs before handing it to Alex. But if there's any questions, um, you can flag them in the chat box and I can answer when Alex is presenting. Um, you're gonna want to import data. Um, that's how you start your project. So you'll go to import and then you'll see a number of options. There's project and capture files, et cetera. So say you did an interview and you have the audio file recording or you have the notes that you took um, for that uh, focus group discussion. You'll go to files and then you can go to here, for example, maybe you want to upload the code book. So you click open and then you would click import and then you're able to upload that file. Now, this is something that's really helpful. Whenever you upload a file, you're going to be provided with a prompt box. So here you can name the file, which um, naming conventions can be really helpful when say you're doing an assessment looking at thousands and thousands of pages of work and that's your data. So you wanna make sure that your naming is associated. And then you can also provide a description. I'm not gonna do this now, but I'm gonna show you where that becomes really valuable um, to include that description in terms of organizing your data. So I'll click cancel because that was a fake example. And then um, another component after you import your data is creating those files um, in those folders. So you'll see this pre-made project that's available on NVivo already has pre-made files. But if you wanted to say, add another thing to area and township, you can hover over and you can click um, create another folder by right clicking. Um, so I'm gonna do new file, for example. And then, so I right clicked and then this pops up. So that's that option. And then, um, you can name accordingly and make sure that it's the right order. Now, the next thing we're gonna go over is the actual coding. Um, so I'll open up this right here and you'll see a number of things. You'll see this modified by and it says WWS. So if I modify something, then my name LKB will show up. Um, and then you also see that they've associated a color wheel with each different code. And that means when you look at the document, you're going to see um, this color highlighted. So to make that less theoretical, I'm gonna pop open this code and show you what that means. See, now you see this is coded under that one that was highlighted blue and it's right here. So anything you code will pop up on this balance. And that way, say you're reading, for example, Harry Potter, and you decide to do a qualitative analysis on Harry Potter, then you pull in the text from the book and Bella codes anything that Ron Weasley says, and then Alex codes anything that Harry says. Um, and then you wanna find only quotes that Harry says. You can have this be named Harry and then it will have all of Alex's codes for just what he said. So if you're doing an interview, it's the same thing. If you wanna have the codes for only um, one person, say it's a female key informant, you can code it accordingly. So it gets really, really helpful to, it's the only way really that you can take thousands and thousands of like minutes or text 
and make it a little bit more digestible. So that is one component. And if you want to add a new code, then you can again right click and say new code. And then this will pop up. You can name what your new code will be. So this is balance. So maybe you want imbalance. And then you see right here, the hierarchical names, it's code balance imbalance. So that this code is going to pop under the one above it. And um, that's how you can add it and say you don't want that, then you can just right click it and delete it. Um, so I will delete that. Another thing that will be really helpful to look at is you'll see these numbers are popping up. So this is corresponding with which files. So before we went over uploading the files and documents and like the different folders. So this shows you how many files balance was coded into. So here it's six different files. Um, and then it also shows you how many times within those six files balance was referenced. Um, so this gives a helpful overview. I can just assume by looking at um, this document that it's really heavy looking at economy and it's really heavy looking at natural environment. So already you're making all of that information that can seem so big a little bit more digestible. Um, so all of this how to code is available in this uh, training document as well. So you have that as that reference. Um, and I'm gonna show one last thing before handing it over and it's a code book. And I think it's one of the really, really helpful components, one of many for in vivo. Um, so first, if you wanna get your code book, you'll go to codes right here and you'll right click. And then you'll have a window pop up that says export code book. And then this pops up and you can click, okay, do you want auto-coded responses, do you want this? And you can customize it to be whatever you want from the codes and you click okay. I already have this, so I'm gonna click no and just show you the file that I downloaded before. And this is what pops up. So you saw those boxes that popped up that you can include a name and then you can include the description. So what you're doing is you're pre-making your code book. Um, you're hitting two birds with one stone. Um, so for attitude, for example, by putting in the description, you can say what you mean as a coder by attitude. And that way, if you're working across a team, you can then share what your description is of attitude. And um, maybe if I'm working with Alex, maybe my definition of attitude is different. So I can export this code book. I can share it with Alex and then we can talk about it before we even get into the weeds with coding together. And we can discuss how to align our, are we on the same page in our description of attitude? Are we gonna look for the same thing when we're looking for attitude um, when we're doing the analysis? So this is really, really helpful. And that's why InVivo has all those boxes pop up that say, do you wanna name this? Do you wanna put a description? Because it feeds into that code book and that code book can actually be an output of your research as well. So it's really helpful just from an organization standpoint to set up all these steps at the at the front end. And it's also just helpful um, for you to have an easier time collaborating with other researchers. That is all I will really get to um, with kind of this overview. Um, but just to know all of this is available, you're welcome to use it. Um, and hopefully it helps you with getting started with in vivo. And I'm going to hand that over now to Alex to get into some of the fun things that Indivo can do as well. All right, thank you, Leah. So I will share mine Indivo screen now. And this is my actual dissertation research that um, Bella and I are working on right now. And you can see that I've uploaded, um, let's see, about 15 files here. And if you want to upload a file, You'll just go to import and then click on files and upload. And you can see that I've coded all these files to with this framework that I built that Bella and I developed. 
Um, and this is an example of deductive and inductive coding. So Bella and I developed this code framework before we started. You see there's a lot of subcategories, sub um, but we also allowed ourselves to create new codes as we're going along. So if we, we start to see themes that are not explained in the framework that we had from, begin, from the beginning, we would add extra codes. So you can see where I put this right now, other factors. Anytime I found a, a factor that wasn't part of my framework, I just added it and started coding here. Um, so what's gonna have to happen for the, after you finish doing a round of coding, you'll go back to your codes. And if there's a code you created halfway through, you're maybe going to want to go back and fill in all the other documents that you would not. For example, if you started on document number five with non-farm activities, you could have had some themes in documents one, two, three, and four that talk about non-farm activities, but you hadn't created this category yet. So you might want to go into your data and try to find other instances, other instances of this specific theme so you can code it to that theme. And I'll show you how to do that in a second. Um, but just like really the mechanical way how to code in NVivo, you will um, go to your files, open one of your files. For example, this is a focus group of women farmers who are non-beneficiaries in the USAID program. Um, open that up and you can see we have all these sub windows here. If you don't want all the sub windows, if you have multiple monitors and you prefer having separate windows for each theme, you'll go to file, options, and then display. And instead of um, window view, let's see, dots, you will select floating. And then every thing that you open will be a separate window. I'm not going to do that today because I don't have more than the screen and I just want to, I don't want to lose what I'm sharing with you, but it's a little bit easier if you open everything as a separate window. Otherwise you keep on getting smaller and smaller sub windows and it gets difficult to read. Um, basically what people would do before in vivo, the really old way of coding would be to print out your transcripts or your notes and read through them and highlight them or you use sticky notes. When you have a specific theme and you find it on your transcript, you'd put a sticky note on the document or highlight it with a specific color. Um, and then uh, people would also use Excel. Um, you can have columns of themes and you'll take your transcripts that are maybe in Microsoft Word and you'll copy and paste sections of it under the different columns based on your themes. Um, but NVivo really makes this a lot easier and allows you to manipulate your data a lot quicker than if you're doing it by hand or on Excel. So here's an example. We don't want the files to be open anymore. Um, so I'll just click on codes here and I can see the code framework that we've developed with all these different codes. Um, and you'll start reading through it and I have to make the text very small so you can see all of it. Um, well, let's just do one example. So we're reading about participation in projects. We're reading about adoption of good agricultural practices. Um, soil preparation with the plow, row planting, applying fertilizer. So maybe I decide that this is an environmental practice. So I'm going to go to this code. I want to code it to environmental sustainability. I highlight it and I click it and I drag it over here. And you can see that that went up to 74. So now there's 74 references coded to environmental sustainability. You keep on going through your document and you may find something that applies to more than one section and you can just click it and drag it to multiple codes and it will go to all of them. Um, and at the end, if you want to look at what you've coded, I can open up environmental degradation, for example, and I'll see what I've coded here. Reference one, that's file one, file two, file three, and you, you just go through sequentially and you will see um, everything that you've coded. So you can see I have paragraphs or sentences that are talking about environmental degradation where people, farmers were mentioning um, environmental problems in their communities or what things that people do that destroy the environment. Um, and if we wanted to maybe add more codes to this and we didn't want to read through every single file, you can see I have like 15 different files. You can go to explore 
and you can click on text search here. Um, the text search criteria will come up and you'll just type in the word or the phrase that you want to search for. So I could say environment. And then I'm going to find exact matches. You could also say with stemmed words, talk, talking, with synonyms. I'm just going to keep it on exact matches for simplicity. And let me um, kind of try to close this a bit so it's bigger. So you'll do run query. And it will show you all of the files and how many references mention the word environment in each of those files. You can see, for example, interview six mentioned the word environment five times. If I open this right here, we see where the word environment comes up. This is a question that I ask, and here is the answer. Um, farmers have to understand, many have understood that you have to change your practices to consider the environment in order to farm sustainably. Um, so you can actually take that right now. If you want to code this to something, click on code again. You can see why having separate windows is better because <laughs> it's really difficult to see everything here. Um, and then I'll code it to whatever category I wanted to code it to, which they're kind of truncated right now, but you'll just click it and drag it. So that's a way to add to your code without having to read through every single transcript. You're using a on Explore, you're using text search. And I want to show a couple of other tools you can use in Viva 4. Um, so again, on Explore, you can use a query. Um, you can query your code to find instances of, let's see. Um, I'm going to collapse these sidebars again really quickly. Um, so we're going to search for everything that is coded to a selected code or case. And you can actually um, create more than one condition. You can get really complicated. You can, you can create as many conditions as you want. Um, so we're going to do coded to, then you click on these three dots here. And you'll go into your coding framework. You might want to see everything that was coded as knowledge and capacities under farmer attributes. And then also that was coded under, okay, also like the codes or cases. We're going to click on this one now. So these are two different theoretical frameworks I'm using, Diffusion of Innovation Theory and a sustainability framework that was developed by B. Rogers and J.D. Coates at Friedman. So maybe I want to see what was coded as capacities under this framework and knowledge and capacities under the other framework. And I'll click OK. So we're looking at everything that's coded to both of these categories at the same time. Then we click Run Query. And everything that comes up was coded to both categories. Um, this is not as interesting because they're both the same thing, capacities and capacities. But you might want to look at the intersection of other factors like capacities and um, let's look at external factors and shocks. Um, let's look at access. Mm, that's probably not going to bring up very much. Let's look at access to land anyways and see what happens. Um, run the query. There's nothing. So these factors are not really similar to each other. We haven't coded anything in our data to, this, to, to both of these factors at the same time, so nothing shows up. So this is a way to explore similarities in your data. And if you find a lot of similarities, and if you find that there are two categories maybe that should be merged, this is a way to decide, OK, I'm going to merge these two together because they're really kind of the same thing. Um, so that's one way to use a query. There's another type of query you can use, which is um, a cross tab. So this query would use both codes, for example, and a case. So you can see I have case classifications. A lot of these you should ignore. Um, they need to be deleted. But for example, beneficiaries. I didn't code sentences and paragraphs here. For the cases, I just put files. So you can see under beneficiaries, I put the entire file for the focus group of male beneficiaries from Conquen, the entire fo focus group of women beneficiaries of Conquen, men beneficiaries in Sion, that's another village, and women beneficiaries in Sion. 
So I coded the entire file to beneficiaries and then non-beneficiaries, same thing. The entire four files for the four focus groups that were in among non-beneficiaries. Male, all four male focus groups. Female, all, all four female focus groups. So what we're looking at in the cross tab is the number of code, the number of times a specific code appears per category, male or female, beneficiaries and non-beneficiaries, um, geographic location, whatever, like uh, whatever criteria that you want to look at with your cases. Um, so I'll do an example really quick. Let's see. We're going to cross tab codes against cases, okay? So we have codes here and cases here. Let me close this, to make it more visible. So add codes by dragging them here. We're actually just gonna click on the flex. There's multiple ways to do it. So let's look at farmer attributes. Let's look at um, hmm, motivation, okay? And then we're going to look at that based on the cases of beneficiaries, non-beneficiaries, um, local NGOs, Burkinabe NGOs, and then ACD Avoca, which is the US-based NGO that was implementing the program for, a for USAID. So let's see what it brings up. We've added these. So you can see I've brought up all the files because all of these files make up the cases. So we run the query and it shows us how many times um, this code appears. Something that was coded to this motivation appears in each of the files. So like in key informant interview one only mentioned farmer motivation twice. Um, key informant interview seven mentioned it three times. Some people mentioned it zero times. Other people met the one focus group of the CM and beneficiaries talked about it four separate times. The CM and non beneficiaries didn't talk about motivation at all. I mean, you can actually have more than one code here. You can, you can add as many codes as you want. Like we could do all of the farmer attributes if we wanted to. Let's just do a few of them. Um, and let's redo this. And you can see it gives us tables with a column for each of the attributes and then how many times it appears in each file. So one that appears a lot is um, knowledge and capacities. You can see here, the Konke male beneficiaries mentioned knowledge and capacities 10 times. The female, the men, the male non-beneficiaries mentioned it five times. So this is a way to compare themes and how often they appear across your different subjects or across different categories of respondents. Um, and you can even use color coding. So the color will give you will the intensity of the color just shows how many how frequently the code appears in a given cell. Um, okay, let's talk about a couple other things in Invivo. Wow, well, that's not what I wanted to do. Um, I really we, use. Yes, we might need to show some of our final material and then see if about we have about fifteen minutes left. Oh, okay. Um, perfect. Perfect. I will wrap up then. Um, the only other thing I really want to talk about is memos and annotations. Memos are basically just notes, and you can just create a new memo, name it whatever you want. It can't, it can't be empty, so I'm going to name it A. Um, and it's just like a Word document. You can type whatever you want in here, and you can even um, link what you're typing here in your notes to specific lines of code in your files. Annotations are basically footnotes that you put in your coded files. If you want to define an acronym, um, you can annotate it. And then um, there's also visual visualizations that I wanted to show really, really quickly. Um, I'll just do a quick example. You can create them using explore, um, charts, hierarchy charts, maps, or you can just go into your code. For example, I want to create a chart with farmer attributes. I'm going to highlight all the farmer attributes. And then I'm going to left click, right click, and I'll do visualized hierarchy chart of codes. And this is a hierarchical tree. 
So the size of the square determines the number of codes, number of references that appear. So you can see a lot of knowledge and capacities, hardly anything in risk aversion, um, hardly anything in age. You can also change this um, to a, let's see. Yeah, so you can change this to, I'm trying to remember the name of this, uh, sunburst. It's called a sunburst. This is another common way of um, visualizing qualitative data. You can see it's the same concept. It's just a pinwheel instead of a hierarchical tree. And um, you can have different levels as well, and it will be concentric circles. But some people prefer to download their data to Excel and use Excel to create these charts instead. But whatever your preference is, but NVivo can be used to make qualitative visualizations. Um, sorry for having to cut this short, but we want to give a little bit of time for questions at the end. So I guess we can go back to the um, power, the Canva presentation to our final slide. Okay. Um, so maybe I'll um, see about two final things. One, uh, we want to just acknowledge uh, the different entities that supported um, the research that we presented on today. Um, and uh, just appreciative to have had this time um, to run this workshop. Uh, we also wanted to do one last thing of showing um, what all of this research can look like in a package. We've talked a lot about um, the different qualitative tools um, that are available and then um, how to actually do it in vivo. Um, and then I'll just show briefly um, examples of how this can all be translated into a document that then might be able to inform uh, research-based decisions. Um, and at the same time, if there's any final questions, uh, feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, these are just two examples of assessments. This example is a strictly qualitative assessment. And then this assessment is a mixed methods assessment. Uh, pulling together some of the uh, components that Alex really touched on earlier about limitations within qualitative analysis, um, participant bias, indicative finding, sampling bias, et cetera. Uh, you'll wanna make sure that's captured in any report that is done. Uh, so we can even share these documents if it's helpful, um, but it's really important to describe exactly how the research is done and indicate uh, the participant bias. But then when you're actually pulling out the findings from a qualitative assessment, you can see kind of the power of having those words that were stated um, in a document. Uh, it really drives home a lot more the message than if you just are doing a report that says, women face social stigma. Okay, what is the social stigma? Um, like here it says, uh, I separate everything across genders. I sleep next to my daughters instead of my husband in order to protect them from illness. Um, and I separate bathing or laundry so to protect my husband. And this is about just practices around menstrual hygiene. So it really does show more nuance to um, the cultural considerations that um, are faced when, when looking at menstrual hygiene in this community. Um, and I think it's a lot more impactful than just having numbers sometimes. So we know that quantitative analysis is really appreciated um, and it has a huge function but having those words from the community are also extremely powerful. Um, so that's just a little bit of a conclusion. And then this is a mixed method assessment as well. Um, so you have the quantitative component that you can actually have statistics for. And then at the end, this report um, concludes with examples from focus group discussions and key informants to show a little bit of um, further nuance for each community. So that's just uh, a few examples of how this can be incorporated into final projects. Um, I'm gonna stop here and pass it over to the other 
um, to Alex and Bella, and it's open for any questions as well. Yes, and we just want to reiterate uh, again that in vivo is not the only tool you can use with qualitative data analysis. We don't want people to think qualitative equals in vivo. Um, it is a very powerful tool and a common tool that's used, kind of like quantitative tools. A lot of people, when they think of quantitative statistical analysis, what comes to mind? R, Stata, SPSS, um, SAS. So in vivo is one of those major tools that is commonly used for qualitative analysis, but it's definitely not the only way to do it. And we encourage you to look into research AI. There's even automated coding, um, machine-driven coding, which might not be appropriate for certain types of data, but it could be better for other types of data where the software will create code categories and code for you automatically, and you can compare that with your own manual coding. Um, there are other products that function similarly to NVivo and that might be more open source. Um, so yeah, just, just kind of a disclaimer that we're showing you qualitative data analysis through the lens of NVivo. Um, but these principles that we're describing can be used in a more universal, universal way, um, whether you're using NVivo or another, another software tool. And then just as a final note, I know we threw a lot at you today. We showed if you've never um, had any interaction with qualitative data, this may have been a little bit overwhelming, but the best way to go about it is just to start practicing and learning yourself. I made a lot of mistakes in the first few months of our um, project. And so I think it's just important to recognize that it's okay to make mistakes, but that it's worth learning. And it's something that's super valuable. Even if you don't do it specifically in your work, it's super helpful to understand what your colleagues um, and where that information is coming from and the processes that help build on the foundation of so social and health sciences. So I would just encourage everybody to um, take a look at the guide that Leah's put together. It's super helpful and informative and um, just keep it in your back pocket in case you ever need it down the road. And we are so grateful that you chose to spend two hours of your Friday afternoon with us um, learning. And if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat or unmute. And we hope you all have a wonderful rest of your weekend. Thank you, that was really great. Does anyone have any questions? Or you wanna share some thoughts? <laughs> okay, appears not. Yeah. I might just um, share one more resource that is available. Um, we do have our, at Tufts, there's the data I think science lab. I don't know if I have the name correct on that, um, but that's another resource available at Tufts uh, that people can access if they have any questions on how to work with in vivo or do analysis um, within in, in vivo. Uh, so a lot of tools available to support and they also have capacity to support beyond just in vivo as well. You can see what their different skill levels are and what packages they're familiar um, with using. Thank you so much, um, Bella, for sharing that. Uh, you can see what each uh, assistant at the data lab um, has training in and use that tool um, to further learn these different platforms.